<coughs> okay, so uh, I'm Michael Homer, like it says. I'm here to talk about an updated directory structure for Unix, which is quite an unenlightening title, really. Um, but we'll go on with it. So the standard Unix structure has survived for many years. But in some cases, it's not optimal or not aligned with the nature of contemporary computing. Uh, our, our structure in GoBlinux is different. It's, um, it's very different. The, the big idea with it is that we have uh, a separate directory for each program. And we use that structure of the directories for programs and for versions of programs in order to, to, to serve as our package database. So there's no external database that could ever get out of date or get corrupted. It's just what's on the file system. Uh, this distribution has been around for several years. I've been a developer on it for uh, what, three or four, and I was a user for longer than that. Uh, also working with me on this presentation have been one of the founding developers, Hashim Muhammad, and one of our most active developers now, Jonas Carlson. Both of them are way on the other side of the world, so they're not here today. Um, about me, my main focus in the distribution has been on package management, that kind of area. So I built a the, the freshen update tool that we have. I was the main architect on the alien system and the youth lakes that we're talking about at the end of the presentation. Th those have been my main focuses. Those are the areas I'm best placed to put questions on. If you have really historic questions, I may not know the answer because I wasn't around at the very beginning. So, big idea there. Like I said, one, direct one directory per program, one program per directory. The that we have a, a, a directory programs directory, which has, for every program in the system, one directory. Inside that directory, there's another directory for each version of that program that's installed at once. There's then a tree of symlinks that go from basically standard locations into those trees so that we can find all the files without having to look through them all every time. It's, it's reasonably efficient. It, it doesn't have, as you might think, a, a large overhead from searching the symlinks all the time. We get asked that a bit. It does have some, I've got to be honest. It probably does have some, but we haven't been able to measure it yet. So one of the very first responses we get from a lot of people is that there's a reason that things are the way they are. And it's true. There is a reason for pretty much every decision that's been made as far as laying out the directory structure in Unix. The trouble is that a lot of those reasons don't actually matter anymore. So it's worth looking into some of the history, where they came from, and where we've ended up now. So. The original Unix structure was designed for large Unix sites. Uh, we have a separate user and root partition so that we can have just the bare minimum on the root, and then we can have user uh, either on a different physical drive or even accessed over the network to, to store our actual applications. On the root, we would just put the bare minimum to boot the system and to act as a single user rescue mode. Those are good reasons. They were good reasons, at least. But there's been, there have been technical advances since then that mean they're no longer optimal. So as far as the, the rescue mode goes, if we need to do any kind of system rescue, we have access to live CDs. We can boot up a full distribution, have a graphical desktop, have access to all of the, the software that we're used to, and we can use that to repair our system. We have a browser, we can go on the network, we can search for answers to our problem, and we can fix it live. We don't need to boot into a single user mode with very minimal functionality. Remote mounting, though, is still a legitimate reason to have that kind of a structure. It's less necessary now because modern desktops and servers have large drives. They can install all their software locally. But it's often still useful from, from an administrative standpoint to have an application server where all of your applications are. The problem with it, though, is that it's been obsoleted from the other direction. What happens when you have more than one application server? You can put one of them on user, you can put one of them on opt, and after that, you're pretty much out of luck. You have to create new, non-standard directories. Uh, the, the systems that I've encountered and that my co-authors have encountered, uh, mostly in universities, have all had several non-standard directories to cover their particular site's uh, needs for applications. There's not really a lot of point sticking to that particular rigid structure when it's no longer actually necessary for the situation to rescue us. And it's not necessary because we have another technical advance. We have union mounts. We can have as many application servers as we want, and we can union mount them 
all on top of one another. That lets us have different configurations for each physical system. It lets us have uh, local overriding. We can combine them in any way that we like. It's, it's, it's efficient. It lets us distribute our programs in whatever fashion we need, and lets us have different configurations on each system, which is very useful. It's no longer the case that every single system will be identical, uh, as was the assumption behind the original system. In fact, in GlobalMax, it is possible, even without a union mount, to have your pro an, any program in an arbitrary physical location without even using a union mount, which I'll discuss a little bit later on. Another distinction that's, that's in there is you have a separate bin and sbin directory, as well as your user and the root. The distinction between them is pretty arbitrary. You have sbin for your super user programs. But there's really not any particular need for that. There's a very robust permission system in Unix that lets you, you can just, if you need to, make something chmod 700 and no one else can access it. A lot of the programs that are required to go into bin have, perf go into sbin, have very valid non-root users. ifconfig is the obvious example. You can read from it, and it's extremely useful as a regular user. In most systems, though, you'll have to give the full path step in order to run it as a regular user. It will work but it won't be in your standard path because you have a separate SBIN directory. We do away with that distinction as well. If you look at the, the FHS and, and the LSB standards, they have what amounts to an arbitrary list of programs that have to go into bin, have to go into user bin, have to go into SBIN. None of those have any particular rationale behind them. A lot of them are there for historic reasons. Exclusively, they're, they're programs that really are no longer used at all, but they're required to go on the route. That's a problem that we aim to, to fix. Now, GlobalLynx, in fact, is fully compatible with that historic structure. We have a separate tree of uh, symbolic links from that legacy tree, from bin, from user, from so on, into the locations that we use. Those links are kept hidden from the user using a, a small kernel patch to the BFS layer called GoboHide. That patch is just cosmetic. All it does is prevent those uh, links from showing up in a directory listing. You can still access them but they don't actually show up. So we have a cosmetically clean system while still having full backwards compatibility with, with the original structure. Now, the structure that we do have is quite different to what you're likely to be used to. So I'm going to try to work through a little bit of an example here. Um, yeah, it is different. You'll get used to it, but it is very different. So for example, we use bash 4.0 as our program when we need one. Bash, all the files from bash 4.0 will be in programs bash 4.0. So the bash executable programs bash 4.0 bin bash. Simple enough. If there are any libraries, they'd be in lib within that, and so on. There's a link from system index bin bash to the bash executable, the physical bash executable. We go through that directory for all of our path lookups. So our path, our path environment variable is only one directory. You never have to have anything more than that because they're all accessible through that one path. Now, if you happen to have bash 3.2 installed as well, perhaps you have to test software against that, it would, all of its files would be under programs bash 3.2. That would be available as well if you want to run it using the exact path to it. But by default, you would end up with whichever one you'd chosen as your current version, which again, we'll get to a little bit later on. So the aim of that structure is to make the, the nature and the structure of the installed programs explicit in the directory tree. You can always tell what files come from what program, and you can tell what, which uh, which program provides what file. Now, that kind of, the advantage of that kind of structure are actually recognized in the FHS itself. We have the op directory, which is specifically for add-on application software packages, and you have to name them directory, the subdirectories of opt, opt program name, very similar to the structure that we have. Uh, you can also have a provider name, which has a complicated registry associated with it, which is not really worth going into. There's also another project-specific directory that's mandated by the FHS and has a long history, which is user x11r6, which we have to have for our legacy compatibility layer, but which, again, is a project-specific directory. It really shouldn't exist according to the principles of the FHS, but it does, and they make everyone use it. Now, there are other directories in the program directory. There are, I mentioned the, the links tree to find that, and there are several other directories that uh, serve as you know, counterparts to the, the regular directories that you're used to in the FHS. Also, something I should mention at this point 
is that historically we have used a structure that we call system links, where we have passed system links, executables, libraries, so on. Our next release is going to use system index, which is slightly different in that, firstly, within that it contains bin, lib, so on, those names, for basically working with difficult software that, um, that, that causes problems. But also, and more importantly, or everything is built against that common prefix and then installed only to their, their particular pro program-specific directory. That change has been in the cards for a while, but was brought up specifically now because CMake is getting very popular. CMake has default behavior. That means, by and large, you can't override one of its automatically configured paths. Um, I don't think it's a good default, but it is a default. You can change that default as the application developer, but it is quite a bit of work to actually make that configurable. So we had to bring this in because otherwise CMake would throw files all over the system and we would have to patch, in many cases, the actual generated make files because its detection code is often part of CMake itself and interacts with itself in various complicated ways. We'd have to patch for every CMake program those files. That's why we switched now. Now, we have a table laying out the correspondences. In most cases, those down the left there, the FHS directories, are sim links to their GoBlinks locations. Got both trees there because I couldn't choose between them. So we'll see we have bin going to the collection executables, sbin as well, and also user bin, user local bin, user x11r6 bin, and I guess user local x11r6 bin all going to the same place. There's really no reason to have a distinction between them, so we don't. We'll have lib there, we have uh, settings for uh, et cetera, and we have those directly at the bottom, mount, dev, sys, proc analogs, which really exists mainly for consistency with the, the programs directory and with the other things we have in there. They're not really necessary, and I guess the obvious question that comes up here is, would it be possible to have an FHS compatible embedding of this, the entire system there? I guess the answer is yes, to an extent, but, well, you would certainly have to have a programs directory that would not be in the FHS. I think it's possible. I think we may do it at some point. Uh, I would be interested in investigating it, but it's not a priority for me. I'm not particularly attached to the locations we have, but we have them and I don't care that much. I don't even have to look at them. So the other question is, we have all those capital letters there, which generate a lot of complaints from people who are, have just showed up. Um, they were not regarded as a problem because, firstly, the shell can tab complete case insensitively, that's not an issue. And secondly, it should be pretty rare that you actually have to type the full path. We used capital letters because we didn't want to have any possible interference, and those we'll use for words, any interference with future directories that were reserved by the kernel or by other uh, aspects of the system, like sys. Um, people would suggest, why don't you have sys instead of system, and then they reserved a sys directory, which would have, would have gotten us in trouble. So, there are quite a few advantages of that structure. You may be thinking of disadvantages, but I'm going to talk about the advantages. It's my talk. First up, manipulability. It's possible to basically to do most of your package management tasks using the standard Unix tools using the file system. It's not necessarily required, well, it's not required, but it's possible. You can find the origin of any executable or any library using which or read link if you run which MK password to find out where that is. It'll, t it'll tell you, programs, who is, 4.7.33, bin, MK password. It tells you what program it came from and what version of that program you're using at the time. It's quite handy. You can use read link on libraries, LSL works as well. So you can do all kinds of operations. You can list out all the programs you have using LS. You can list out all the files from a particular program using LS or using find. You can remove a program even using just RM. Uh, it probably wouldn't recommend that, but you can. So. I should clarify that it's not necessary to do all those tasks using, manually using the, the standard tools. We have our own tools that wrap up those commands, do them in clever ways. Often they are more clever than what you would do yourself, uh, and they're more efficient. So while it isn't necessary, it is possible and it's frequently useful to be able to do that. Read operations in particular are very convenient uh, using just the standard POSIX command. You can script things up to do quite complicated analyses or quite complicated changes even using just those commands because they are the, the commands that you're used to and they have 
well-defined, easy-to-use behavior that plays in, plays in perfectly with, with our entire system. We always use a live program tree, so if you remove something, it stays removed, and it is understood to be removed by the rest of the system. Next up, parallelism. It's possible inherently to install multiple versions of a program at once. Like I mentioned, we have batch 4 and batch 3.2. Now, where the, li where the names of those files don't conflict, like for most libraries, they have so names with full versions, they can all be active at once. So you could have, say, OpenSSL, which breaks its compatibility for every version, and you could have multiple versions at once, so you don't have to rebuild all of your software when you installed a new version of OpenSSL. You probably want to rebuild eventually, because presumably they have a new release for a reason, but you don't have to do it straight away. As well for other libraries, like well, no, libpng, you could be using multiple versions at once. Now, when they don't have uh, distinct names, like executables mostly do not have distinct names for each version, you have one version that's active at, at the time, your current version, which is what we call from the rest of the system, but you can also access all the other versions just by giving their full path. And of course, you can easily figure out the full path because the structure is very explicit about that. So you can run executables from programs that aren't enabled from multiple versions at once, and you can switch between those versions at any time. So a lot of distributions have a version of that functionality for some specific programs. GCC is a common example. So you can switch between GCC4 and GCC3 if you're testing something out. We can do that for every program without any kind of special treatment. They all work the same. It's fully generic across every single program in the system that you can have multiple versions and you can switch between them. That's something of a trait that we have generic versions of functionality that other places have as, as very specific tied down functionality for particular programs. So, unpackage software. In this case, you can take software that is not yet packaged by distribution, so it's available as source, but not in distribution yet. You can build it up and you can install it into programs yourself. And it will have all of the advantages of the package management system. You can remove it cleanly afterwards, which bypasses one of the big disadvantages of building your software into user local, which is that you basically have to keep the build trees around so that you can uninstall. And you can also switch between versions, all the other things that come with ordinary programs. That's quite an advantage. You can also take something that's distributed as a tarball, like, like Firefox, or as was mentioned at District Summit on Monday, a lot of enterprises, enterprise software is shipped as a giant one gigabyte tarball that you're supposed to extract in your route, and then you have files strewn everywhere that you can't get rid of at the end. You can do that here, extract it into a single directory, and you can remove it later on in a clean fashion. It is quite convenient. If that software is later included in the distribution, your installation is a first-class citizen. You still have the opportunity to upgrade it, to remove it, all those things, even though there's now a new version which will provide the same files. You just upgrade to that version and remove your old version, you're fine. It's never an issue that the software came from outside the distribution, except when you're actually building and installing it. And in that case, there's no extra work beyond what would actually be involved in building and installing it in the first place. It is, it is very convenient. Now, in combination, those three main advantages that we need to provide have advantages of their own. They're very flexible. They let the system adjust to the needs of the system administrator rather than trying to bend the administrator to it. And one of the assumptions that we have is that the system administrator knows what they're doing. If they want to switch between versions, we should let them. If they want to remove something, we should let them. That is a key philosophical point, that our administrator knows what they're doing. They're also very handy as far as system repair goes. Because you can restore the package management database using only those standard tools, you can use the LiCD from any distribution at all, mount your drive, and you can fix it. Uh, in fact, because of that, if you have a statically linked set UID busy box, obviously a recent busy box where set UID is safe, you can recover from virtually any system problem just by using that. So if, you can, if you're running your system and you decide, I want to remove my running libc, you can do that, and then you can recover from it, and everything will be fine. There is no database that gets out of date. It can't possibly get out of date. And you can link in, change your versions, whatever. If you've broken your system, you can fix it. So experienced users report that they have never encountered a situation where they had to reinstall. Sometimes people want to reinstall because you know, it's a bit of a hassle, but you can always fix the situation, no matter how dire it is. Situations that would be fatal for other distributions are generally not fatal here. Now, the, the slogan that's gone with that historically has been, the file system is the package manager. That has often led to a lot of misconceptions. It's not the case that, well, it's not firstly that you have to manipulate everything manually. We have tools for, for working with that. 
We have tools for working with, uh, within the system. And we have, uh, we have tools for working with it. We have uh, build tools, we have installation tools, we have uh, linking tools to manipulate those. You don't have to do it manually. Uh, it would be more accurate to say that the file system is the package management database. That's true, and it, is, it doesn't give rise to those misconceptions. So hopefully to forestall some of those misconceptions, I will go through a few of those uh, tools that we, that we do have. First up, working with the, the links, disable program. It will, you give it your program and it will remove all of the links to that program. So it's no longer accessible from the rest of the system, but you can still access the files. They're still there if you want to run them using the full path to them. That's sometimes useful to be able to, to run them like that, have an intentionally disabled program. But the most common use of that directly would be to disable something, wait a while, see if you needed it, and then you can remove later on with remove program, which both disables the program and deletes the files. You don't ever have to curate the links manually, although you could if you wanted. You also don't ever have orphaned links left over from removed software, unless you want to, which I guess you might for some reason. It's not required that you do that. Symlink program creates all of the symlinks. It's, in called, it's called automatically during the installation process, and you can call it as a user later on, uh, in particular, to switch between versions, like I mentioned, or to reverse the behavior of the disable program when either you're, you're done with the testing or you've discovered that you've disabled something that you were actually using. That is that those three tools in particular are very convenient and they, it's not necessary ever to manipulate the links manually. We do have tools for that. I wish people would stop suggesting otherwise. You won't. Now, compile. Compile is a tool to fetch source code, build software from source, and install it into the system. It's not required that you build everything manually. So the compile uses a, a database of recipes. Those are very simple declarative files in most cases that specify how the software is built. So the simplest possible recipe is that. It's two lines long. It says where you got the software from and what kind of a build system it has. In this case, configure means anything that behaves like autoconf. One of the main focuses we have there is to put the, the clever stuff into the tool. Have a clever tool and a not clever recipe. Recipe just to specify what needs to be done and the tool will understand how to do it. So compile understands the behavior of the autoconf system. It understands CMake, it understands whatever other build systems are available that I don't remember anymore. So by and large, it's not a lot of work to, to make a recipe. And that's allowed us to get recipes for thousands of distinct programs, even though we have a relatively small user base compared to other distributions. It's very easy to make them. In fact, we have a tool, make recipe, that you give a URL, it will fetch that, it will write a recipe with, with that URL in it, and also with the checksum and the file size so that we can make sure it's the same file, and then it will do some diagnostics to try and figure out what kind of a build system that file represents. And it can write, in many cases, write the entire recipe for you, which will just be four lines long. A lot of recipes are just those four lines. In those cases, you don't have to do any work at all. However, they can be much more complicated. It's a very powerful system. So a more complicated example with, with optional functionality with uh, extra configuration is this. Let's walk through it. So we see at the top there, compiled version. It's saying what version of the tool it's designed to work with. URL, file size, MD5 I mentioned. A mirror URL, which is one off the side, saying another location if we can't use the first one. Uh, recipe type, a directory within the source that we're supposed to use. I should also say, I've cut this recipe down to put on the slide so it doesn't actually make sense as a whole, if you're wondering why it looks so weird. Uh, some configure options, including a variable target there, which will, may vary depending on what program you're building or what, what version of the program you're building, so we don't generally have to change them too much in between versions. Uh, with ACL, that's an optional behavior. If we want ACL support, we part, we'll end up passing with ACL support into configure. We have make file variable called install, and we have, we see at the bottom there, it's not necessarily an entirely declarative system. If you need to execute something, we can. You can also do some other really complicated things. You can have uh, functions like that that are executed depending on what optional behavior is being specified. You can even override an entire stage of the build system in that process if you want to. You can define a do build function, which we called instead of the default function. They are very powerful, but by and large, we try to keep them simple. We try wherever possible to keep them declarative. If there's something we're having to do a lot, yeah, without something we're doing a lot, repeating between recipes, that usually indicates there's something that we should build into the tool and have work in a declarative fashion. Our dependencies are listed in a separate file. They have 
uh, basically just a listing of, of program names and of versions that we need of those. And that they will be verified against the live system, against the program tree. So if you've installed something manually, it will be picked up and it will be used to satisfy a dependency in that. But by and large, you can just run compile foo and it will fetch the recipe for that program. It will check dependencies. It will install loads if necessary. And then it will fetch the source code, unpack it, extract it, build it, and install it, link it up, everything, all in one step. It does work that way. Packages. We also have binary packages. Uh, it is not a source-based distribution, whatever Wikipedia says. It is, we do have those packages. They are often a little more out of date than the recipes, in particular because you know, the recipes are very easy to make. Uh, also, we have, at time, we have attracted a lot of people who are interested in a source-based system. You don't have to use the packages if you don't want to, but they are available. People aren't required to build from source if they don't want to. Now, those packages are, in fact, just tables. It's just a table of the entry in the program tree. So they can be extracted straight out into the program tree, linked in, and installed. That is very useful for system repair. If you have tar, bzip2, and ln, you can install a package. You can do that from another distribution, or you can do it, like I said, from, from BusyBox. They have very low barrier to, to installing them, so you can repair your system very easily. Okay. Now, these two don't really uh, relate to misconceptions so much, but they have a very cool functionality that I alluded to earlier. The detach program will take a program in the, the program tree and move it to another physical location, create a link from the program tree back to that, link the program in, so you can have your program spread across as many physical locations as you want. Without using a union file system, you can have as many, arbitrarily many network servers serving whichever ones of your programs you want to use. Attach program does, in a sense, the reverse. It takes a remote tree and links it into the system. Using those two together, you can have some very powerful functionality. I think it's a better solution than UnionFS in most cases. It may not be sometimes, but unless you spread your programs on a per program basis rather than having to have a physical location tied to the logical location. And it's also particularly useful for something like this. I have on my netbook here, I have uh, some software available that's not actually installed on here because it has a very small drive. I don't want to install all that software on there. When I'm at home, I have access to a server that has that software on it, and I have links from here to that. When I'm on my home network, that software is all available if I'm using this at home. When I'm not, those links just don't resolve and the software drops out of the system silently. That I see as an advantage here, other times it may be less of an advantage, but it is, those two programs frequently are very useful. Now, alternative approaches. There are a few that are, few systems that are superficially at least similar to Global Linux, but often they, in fact, have different goals, different aims, and work in a different fashion. So, STO. You know, STO is a system for installing software on, for installing software additionally to your, your base distribution. So it takes control of a directory, use a local STO, and inside of that it puts a directory for each program. Much like us, although it does have a limitation, it can't support multiple versions of anything. You can only install uh, application software, not, never any kind of system software. It creates links though, much the same way as we do in use a local bin and, and so on. NCAP is very extremely similar, in fact, to STO. I couldn't distinguish between them other than their alternative implementation of the same idea. Both of them are based on Depot system, which was developed at CMU. Um, the major difference between them and Depot, and Depot and us, is that Depot does have a, an external database that can possibly get out of date. Both STO and NCAP use the file system as the, the live repository of program data. Nexos. Nexos is one we get a lot of questions about. It's, it's a very interesting project. Uh, the aim of Nexos, or Nexos, it looks similar because it has it installs programs into their own directory. It supports multiple versions simultaneously. But its goal is to be a system configuration management system, not to be a whatever we are. <laughs> it's hard to say sometimes. Uh, it uses cryptographic hashes to ensure that uh, it has consistency and atomic operations. So you can't ever install software outside the system or manipulate things manually. You will basically cause it to fall to bits. It focuses instead on, on building the entire system from a kind of functional expression. So those functional expressions can be rolled back or sent to other systems and you'll get an identical result at the end. It, it is very cool. I don't want to knock the system. It's very interesting. I, I just, I personally appreciate the flexibility that I get from our system more so than I would appreciate the, the functionality that I get from Nexos. But it is very interesting. And Mac OS 10. It also has a Unix kernel. It also has, per 
uh, program directories, and also has a standard Unix tree that's hidden from the user in a fashion sort of similar to GoBehide. Software installation happens in the standard macOS way, uh, and you can't really manipulate the, the tree directly. At least if you do, you're liable to break things. It wouldn't be recommended. So it looks somewhat similar, and it was an inspiration for some of the design decisions that were made here. But again, none of those systems really are, are actually all that comparable, although they look superficially to be similar, at least. Okay. Next up, a couple of other features that are slightly less related to the structure and more to the philosophy that that structure embodies. First up is an alien system here. The goal of the alien system is to tie in domain-specific package managers like CPAN, LoRox, RubyGems, Peer, all of those systems that are growing everywhere these days, and, and integrate them fully into the rest of the system. I talked about this at the Distro Summit on Monday, if anyone was there. This is going to be a sort of a user-focused talk rather than an implementer, so it's probably still going to be useful, I hope. So those systems are, are very popular these days. They're increasingly popular, and for many languages, they are the only obvious way to distribute software, or even the only way that software is distributed at all, uh, RubyGems in particular. A lot of software is available only as a RubyGem. That's convenient for the authors. It's less convenient for distributions because they basically have to repackage everything, many thousands of packages. And for the gems, it's quite difficult when they're only released that way. So our goal here is to embrace those systems rather than trying to extinguish them. They are very popular for a reason. Users want to use them, and they want to use the software that's available through them. So rather than taking the, the historic route that we've taken and that other systems take of deprecating them and wishing they didn't exist, saying don't ever install anything from them, we won't support you, we, we've chosen to embed them into the system. Rather than wrapping them, which we also considered, which has some, some problems. It, it's a lot of work. Um, it has drawbacks in that it's likely the package will get out of date very quickly. It's likely that we'll miss some of the important nuances of the third-party system. So users historically have given their distributions and out of refusal to, to provide those systems. They've tried to install them themselves. Hopefully they've put them into user local. Often they've actually put them on top of the user tree and have clobbered files from the distribution, which is very damaging, often fatal. That's clearly not ideal. Now, our structure is more able to support that kind of thing. You can give it its own programs entry. Link it in. It's still clunky. It, kind of works though, but it, it is clearly not ideal. So, and actually in any case, when you do that kind of thing, you end up with conflicts regardless because it's not obvious which version, which installation is being loaded. If you have the package that's been wrapped by your distribution and the third party package installed, which one gets loaded may depend on a whole variety of things. For RubyGems, it can be extremely complicated, which things get loaded, what load path it uses. You also get very difficult to track down bugs when you end up loading both versions of the same library and they're binary incompatible. I had that with a CPAN module. It was incredibly difficult to track down. It's just not obvious. So the key insight we had here, if you can call it that, is that those systems like to call themselves, like to treat themselves as if they're just one program as a whole. Uh, all of their components they treat as part of themselves. So we adopted that pose ourselves. We'll treat them, the system as a whole, as a single program. We'll give it its own tree. In our case, we call it System Aliens Lure Rocks, System Aliens CPAN, that kind of thing. Let them control that fully, install it, lay it out however they want, and then let the user manipulate that in the standard way that they're used to. So if you run Lure Rocks install JSON, it will fetch that, install it into there. You don't even have to know at this point that the alien system exists. The novel part, though, is that as well as the user being able to install their own software, programs within the distribution are able to depend on libraries that are available from those third party systems. That would specify a dependency, Lure Rocks JSON, and it will be satisfied automatically by the system. That lets us access all of the, the packages that are available through those systems, basically for free. We also get access to all of the domain specific knowledge that the, the maintainers and the authors of that software have about their stuff. It does seem a little bit like it's a step back from the explicitly structured tree that GoBlinks has, but the, taking advantage of that domain-specific knowledge is, is really handy. Getting access to all those packages is really handy. As well as that, even if we chose another path, the users would end up installing their own trees themselves anyway. They always have, and they probably always would. We've tried to work with them rather than trying to work against them at this point. Next up, use flags. Those are similar to the ones you find in Gen2, and they've also taken our inspiration from the BSD port system directly. 
uh, they let you do build time configuration of uh, software that's been built from source. The, the, they're very simple in our system. We try to fit it in with our philosophy. So they're mostly used in a declarative fashion within recipes. And by and large, we let configure do its own auto detection of whatever software needs to be there. Also, we only mostly use them when the flag actually introduces a new dependency. Now, that lets us name the flag after that dependency, and let's just do the interesting thing that comes next. Automatic flags. If you have a program installed, the flag of the same name is automatically enabled. It does, that gets enabled before the configuration file, so you can override it if necessary. But the assumption is that if you've installed a program, you want support for it elsewhere. So we will automatically build for that wherever it's possible. You can override it, but the presumption is that uh, until you explicitly say otherwise, you want to use it. We also have generic flags, which cover a whole sort of domain of, of implementations. That's probably best covered with an example. Um, we have a GUI generic flag, which, if it's enabled, will build in a GUI support, whatever GUI support a program supports when you install it. It will have a, a list of, of systems in order of user preference on their particular system. So it might say Qt4, GTK2, Qt3, GTK1, Motif, whatever. And it will, when you build something, it will check. GUI flags on. Do we have Qt support? No. Do we have GTK support? Yes. I'll build with that. That lets us give the sensible behavior, the behavior that users expect by default, while still having any kind of uh, flexibility that's necessary in order for the user to configure the system how they want. Rootless. Rootless gives you a, a Gobelin-like layout inside your home directory. So you'll have either in the directory directly or in a subdirectory, a programs tree, a links tree, all those things. So you can install software into your home directory without you know, needing root access to the entire system. That was originally built by, by the developers in order to install software into their university account, but they didn't have root access. Simple enough. So it works within Gobelinks. If you try to build software or install a package and you don't have the rights to that, installing a package doesn't really work because of paths, um, it will offer, do you want to set up a rootless installation in your home directory? And it will do it automatically. But it also works in other systems. Uh, people have gotten it working in a whole variety of systems, and, and obviously in other Linux distributions, but also in, in Sigwin. In, in the other various commercial Nixon, in, in, in Mac OS X, which I guess is a commercial Unix as well, all of those systems have, have been, been made to work with the rootless system. So you can get many of the advantages, not all of them, many of the advantages of the global Linux layout within another distribution when you don't have access to, uh, to your own system. So to sum up, we install each program in its own directory. We use those directories as a live package database, and by and large, we try to accommodate ourselves to the system administrator rather than trying to accommodate the system administrator to us. There's some links, our website, the blog, which has also posts uh, more often than the, the main page, the obvious free node place, and my contact details because I'm an egotist that way. So, do we have any questions? Okay. Going to for for questions, mark. please just wait for the microphone so the streaming users can hear your question as well. What do you do with uh, slash etc, especially things like etc, samba, smb.com? Could you repeat that last part? Uh, uh, slash etc, uh, samba, uh, slash smb.com, which can get quite hairy. Right, so we have uh, each program installs its settings into its own directory, and then we have that tree of symbolic length system settings, which stands in for etc, into those places. Now. We also have directory expansion, things like Apache, where, you inst where multiple programs might install configuration files into that. For situations where you have quite complex, hairy files, you do have to maintain them yourself. We have some, obviously, the, the standard three-way diff kind of algorithms to make it update automatically, but you do have to maintain them the same way you would elsewhere. We can't do anything magical with them, unfortunately. With the, um, the use flags, I presume you have negative Use flags yeah. like Gen2? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can turn them on, you can turn them off. Um, particularly, you can disable flags that have been turned on automatically, which is important. Yeah. Per product? Per, per, per program, yeah. Each flag. Can your tools be used to install uh, a tree of applications in just a, an entirely arbitrary place, uh, like the rootless, but not necessarily for a home directory? 
a brute list will work anywhere, it's not tied to the home directory. You can also use some of those detached program, attached program tools, create pretty much any physical structure that you want within a running system. Brute list, uh, is is useful, but it's not it's not the full system, it has some drawbacks to it. In fact, you can't install binary packages ever because of the, the paths won't be the same. Um, it's useful for porting, but you know, it's not something that you really want to use when you have the alternative of using a real system. Uh, but the physical layout is always independent of the logical layout. Um, how do you cope with uh, a user who downloads just a source package or a source um, table from the internet and builds and compiles it themselves? Um, it will end up in all the wrong places, will it not? Right. If they do that themselves and they let it go into all the wrong places, it will go into all the wrong places. But if they just give it the right prefix, which any kind of you know, sensible build system, auto let you, autocomp certainly lets you give a prefix, they'll install it into the right place and then the packaging database will pick up that, that tree. We have a, a tool, I didn't mention it, prepare program, which is slightly misnamed, which will, uh, for an autocomp based system at least, it will create the tree and then it will give the right flags to, to build with it. And I just have a follow on question. Um, since the directories slash sys slash proc slash dev and so on are actually mandated to be those names mm. by the kernel and mm. all of the tools, um, and the kernel itself actually looks in sbin and bin for its programs that it directly mm. executes, you kind of need to keep those symlinks there forever anyway. Yeah, but we so are what, going to keep those links here. Yeah. Also? We will be keeping those So links what is the advantage? If the, if the old paths are still there and you still have a root file system full of symlinks, what's the advantage other than sort of parallel installation that this gives you? Uh, okay, the big advantage of the system is the way that you are able to install programs, more so than the rest of the structure. I'm not personally particularly attached to the rest of the structure, but uh, you know, it comes with the system. Uh, for consistency's sake, I, I'm okay with it, but like I said, I think it would be possible to create an FHS compatible embedding. It might happen at some point. I'll probably give it a try when I get some time. I the, the key point is it doesn't really matter what the directories are called. Um, Opt, opt sort of already gives you that. Um, it doesn't, the, the behavior that's specified for opt is not actually all that useful in, in a lot of cases. Um, you can install programs with particular names in a particular directory, which is fine, you can remove them later on, but it only works for, basically, it's add-on application software packages, which is not what most of what you have in your system, and you don't have any real way of manipulating it. You don't have, particularly, you don't have the links into the main, for the, to the executables into the libraries. So opt is kind of suboptimal for what uh, for what we actually do here. More? Could you then uh, consider the kernel to be a program? The kernel is a program. Everything is a program. So you could put it under your programs kernel and all your modules would be? Uh, yeah, under it's, uh, it's under uh, programs, Linux, all the versions in there. Um, because of some of the way that the kernel actually works, we do copy the files out of it. Uh, we have a, a concept of unmanaged files that get copied into another location, which lets you do a, uh, a boot partition, particularly that some people want for various reasons, and uh, also because the kernel has some insistences on exactly where it finds some of its files. But yes, the kernel is treated as a, a program the same as everything else. Uh, one last question. What happens with a single source package that builds multiple binaries? I'm thinking about something like GNU Core Utils. Okay, so Do you put all the little utilities into yeah. one binary? Or? Our general philosophy is that uh, the upstream defines what's in their software. So if they have one package, we have one package. We don't split things out. We especially don't split things out into libfoo and libfoo dev, that kind of thing. If there's one upstream package, it's one package in our system. We also don't patch things. By and large, we, our principle is that Upstream defines what's in their software and how it works. We try not to change it any more than necessary to make it run and fix bugs. Okay, so I think we're done. Thank you. If anyone has more questions, you can email me or what have you. Uh, just before we just before we break for the afternoon festivities, uh, Linux Confer, you would like to thank uh, Michael for his presentation and sharing his uh, expertise with us with a bottle of uh, Fiasco wine from our sponsors. So thank you. Please give him a hand. <laughs> Okay, following this uh, in about 14 minutes over in the auditorium, the main, uh, just across the hallway here, will be the closing uh, presentations. Thank you.